thank you that you are God over all the earth. Open our hearts, we pray today, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that your word may transfigure our minds and our hearts to be in step with you and your purposes. May any adversarial attack, may any temptation of the world, any frailty of the flesh, be removed and ineffectual as we are recipients of your grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we are going to start chapter 3. Uh, this is the time of mission. Make sure I'm quiet here because I don't want to be that guy who's got his own phone ringing. For real, I got invited to go pray with the, uh, the monks in Charlestown this week. So I go in for their service at 8, which is all in Latin, and I silence my phone. But do you know what happens? Silence. The phone was quiet, and the, the watch started making noise. And I said, oh. oh. But I was, it was right when things were getting ready to start, so I was able to do it quick. But, you know, it's not like they got background music playing in that place. Okay. Where are the monks? In the old St. James's old building. So oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So... I discovered uh, probably the end of last year that there's a priory. I knew there was the priory was in there about two years ago, uh, but there's a priory with monks doing prayer all of, like the hours of prayer. Across the street is the online uh, education that uh, that Rome has, and they've got like seven or eight hundred students. Wow! There, I've so, seen them out praying in their garden in the evening. Yeah. When I'm driven by. Yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, that goes to something because, you know, you think about the things that you want to see the church doing. Well, you've already essentially got 24-7 prayer happening through the hours of prayer in town. Like, it's already going on. Um, and they're, they're sincere fellows. I mean, I've spent a good bit of time with them. Uh, mostly just when I'm walking in the evenings, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the time of mission. Sections 1 through 3... Um, is when he starts to identify the problem. Can you turn the fan on? Yeah, on that thing. Uh, he starts to identify the problem, um, and then he jumps into the Sunday, what's going on on Sundays. But then that's sections one through three, really. And then four through seven is when he expands beyond that to talking about the years, weeks, days, and times. He, he breaks, it, breaks it up like that to really start talking comprehensively about time itself. So, let's, uh, let's just jump right in here on the, the first paragraph. He says, as we leave the church after the Sunday Eucharist, we enter again into time. Because remember that the Eucharist is the ascension. We, we, we become the body of Christ by union with him, and that is, that is manifest when we're gathered together, participating in the ascension. It is indeed the icon of our fundamental reality of the optimism as well as the pessimism of our life. Our life as life and our life as death. This next sentence, through time, on the one hand we experience life as a possibility, growth, fulfillment, as a movement toward a future. Through time, on the other hand, all future is dissolved in death and annihilation. Uh, theologically, you would call that the already but not yet. The already and not yet. Meaning, Christ is already the king over all things. He has already been raised from the dead. He has already poured out the Spirit. I, I saw, saw something uh, earlier this week. I plan on mentioning it in, 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 the, in the sermon. Maybe I will. But a lot of Christians are waiting, as it were, like for a second Pentecost. Well, that's not good. There's only one Pentecost. And that one event of Pentecost is an ongoing reality in the church while we wait for the second coming of Christ. So we get our focus all discombobulated. And I think a lot of that has to do with because we don't have a proper concept of time. We don't know what already is. And then we can go the other way. We say, well, because he is already the Lord, there should be no sickness. There should be no death. There should be no pain. There should be no suffering. But well, hold on but it's not yet. So it's started, but it's not fulfilled. And we're stuck in that tension. So that, that's kind of what he's describing here. 
So we know when we observe the world around us, it's always decaying. It's always dying. It's death and annihilation. is like you're dead a lot longer than you're alive. Right? Just as the natural world goes. And he's saying here that when we leave, when we go out back into the world, send us out into the world to do the work that you've given us to do. When we go back out into the world, we're going carrying both life and death. Uh, next paragraph, he says, All philosophy, all religion, is ultimately an attempt to solve the problem of time. This is really, this is really significant because you know, he gets into some pretty um, real problems in this chapter talking about time. He says, The church offers not a solution to this philosophical problem, but a gift. It becomes a solution only as it is accepted as freely and as joyfully as it is given. So, time and the problem of time, he will explain it a little bit more later on um, with the notion of vacations and relaxing. And we have done such a horrible, time, a horrible job in the way that we approach time that people will self-medicate because they can't deal with their lives. Well, wait a second. And then if you take a like a if you take a, a fundamentalist approach, meaning you take a, a hard line approach, and you say, um, well, that's because they don't have faith. But then you don't understand the problem. You don't understand the problem. I, I'm going to throw this out there. I, I was talking to somebody earlier this week. It wasn't the interns. It was somebody else. I forget who it was. But he was. We were talking about prophets and prophecy. I said, you know, it's been taught for years in the, the latter port, the neo Pentecostal and the early charismatic movement, that prophets are people that see things in black and white. I said, that's not true. That's not prophetic. That's just somebody who likes to bludgeon with Bible verses. That's not prophetic. Look at what the prophets are in Scripture. That's a very poor summary of that gift. But we see people cloak those kinds of uh, heart issues that they have. And their failure to understand things by saying, well, if you have more faith, if you have more faith, if you have more faith, you don't understand the problem. And it's one of the reasons this is a good chapter, because of time and what is happening in time. So uh, section two, I want you to notice the, the first sentence. He says, to understand the gift. What is the gift that the church gives to, to redeem? What is the gift? He says, once again, we turn to the liturgy. Everything is liturgical. We've been emphasizing that. And I know that it's still a foreign idea in some extent. But lex orandi, lex credendi, what you pray is what you believe. And the way that you pray shapes the way that you believe. So if you go into any, any church, any typical church right now in the United States, and you say 90% of them are going to tell you that they believe in the Trinity. But you're not going to see it reflected in the Sunday service. You're not going to see it reflected liturgically because no one talks to God the Father through the Son, by the Spirit. No, no one said in the name of the Father and the Son. and the, there, Nothing Trinitarian exists at all except when they do baptismal services. So they will, they'll have on a piece of paper that you've got to check the box to become a member, yet we believe in the Trinity. But that's not demonstratively evident in anything that's happening on a Sunday. Now, well, say, what's the big deal with that? Well, there's a lot of reasons that's a problem. But one of the, the effects of that is that the, the people don't think Trinitarian. And so then they don't conduct themselves in their daily work, send us out into the world. They don't conduct themselves in the world as a people who believe in a triune God, which changes how they approach everything. And that even that notion is so foreign to contemporary Christian minds. So what the church prays is what the church believes, which is one of the th reasons that when the Reformation was going on in England, they didn't spend their time writing massive systematic theologies like some of the other uh, reformers did. Now, there were guys that did that. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But that wasn't the emphasis. The emphasis was the prayer book. What we pray is what we believe. And we better make sure that what we are believing and what we are praying is scriptural and, the, as, and as the scripture has been understood by the fathers and by the consensus of the church. So it's lex orandi, lex credendi. Here we're going to apply it to time. We're going to apply it to time. 
The feasts and the seasons, the cycles of prayer, a very real concern about the kairos, the time of liturgical celebration. You, if, you, if you're familiar with some of the preaching that happens about times and seasons, times and seasons, it's either usually applied to like the Antichrist, or it's applied to something, um, something spiritual, like something disconnected from the material world. Never do that, by the way. You can't disconnect the spiritual from the material. There are two aspects of the same thing. That's not, a, that's not a good way of looking at that. The seasons, like right now we are in ordinary time. This is a kairos. So the kairos of ordinary time is a season. And green, not to get too much on the Sunday, or, or to the sermon, but green is the liturgical color for the Holy Spirit. Not red. Red is the color for the gifts. Green for the Spirit because He is the Lord, the giver of life. And so what has been the emblematic color universally for growth and development? Right. So he's talking about, and so I want you, let's keep going down through here because he, what I'm trying to say is I don't want to get into too much explanation and not get far enough along in the chapter. <clears throat> he says, um, the world of Christian symbolism is no longer our world. All this failed. All this is gone, and we have more serious affairs to attend to. So think about the way a lot of people, modern secular people, and even some in the church, think about Christianity as a bunch of myths. It's not real. It's a myth. And they also then look at the liturgy and the celebration of the service through the same lens. It all failed. Let's not keep it. It's just a pretense story, a bunch of pretense stories from the Middle Ages when they also believed in fairies. Which isn't true, but that's the line today. It would be unthinkable, ridiculous to try to solve any problem of modern life by referring to Easter or Pentecost or even to Sunday. Now here's where he gets spiky, okay? He says, uh, are these symbols merely symbolic? Or is this a failure because the church didn't explain why the church was doing these things? The Christians ceased to understand their true nature. Hey, listen, every time you find a new denomination or, or network or movement or something that disassociates itself from the historic church, it in the course of 75 years will recreate almost everything that they rejected. They will recreate the office of overseer. Right? That's what's happening in the, in the charismatic movement now. It's old enough now that they're creating their own apostles. Why? Because you rejected the bishops. They rejected Lent because that's religion and Roman Catholic and people who do, are bound by a spirit of religion. So what did they do? They created a 21-day Daniel fast every January. And if they were half as intelligent as they think they are, they would understand that by celebrating that fast in January, they're doing more historically to honor the Roman god Janus than they are Christ. But they don't think. It's all right here. I'm feeling. It always recreates, and typically in a worse form of recreation than what was rejected because it's not done with the consensus of the rest of the church. And he's saying here, why does the world have a disparaging view of time and, and that time has been redeemed by Jesus because the church has rejected its own calendar. It's rejected its own liturgy. It's rejected its own understanding of time. In our attempt to be relevant, we've become irrelevant. He says, on the contrary, he's talking about symbols and, and whatnot. This is uh, towards the end of the large paragraph under section two, the second paragraph. On the contrary, the spiritualization of Christianity has made it a religion by dismissing the really physical, tangible reality, sign, symbol, form, rejecting all of that has turned it into a religion by spiritualizing it. And religion, as we already know, has thus come to mean a world of pure spirituality, a concentration of attention on matters pertaining to the soul. Christians were tempted to reject time altogether 
and replace it with mysticism and spiritual pursuits. To live as Christians out of time and thereby escape its frustrations. To insist that time has no real meaning from the point of view of the kingdom, which is beyond time. He says, it is impossible to put Christ back into Christmas because time doesn't matter if you go with the modern line. Why would we say put Christ back into Christmas unless Christmas meant something? Mm -hmm. And if Christmas means something, months mean something, days mean something, seasons mean something. This is the gift the church has that she received. And, I'll, and he doesn't get into this, but where does the whole notion of a church calendar come from? But the calendar that God gave Israel. Now, the difference is all of that's fulfilled. Every calendar event in Leviticus, all of the Old Covenant, already fulfilled. So, what, And this is the debate that's happening in the early church. Do we have to get circumcised? Because circumcision doesn't exist as something isolated from the rest of the law. It's the entrance into the covenant and thereby obedience to the whole law. And so the, the statement by, the, by the, the fathers in Acts 15, of the fathers of that council, the, the apostles and, and elders, that no, you don't need to be circumcised is a recognition that Christ fulfilled the whole thing. But does this mean that they got rid of the celebration of times and seasons? No. We don't celebrate Passover with the shedding of lamb's blood and pouring it up and spreading it off the doorpost. No, we celebrate the Eucharist. There's a difference. No, we don't keep Sabbath as the day, which you'll get into at length, uh, because Christ fulfilled it. We keep the Lord's Day because it's the first day and the eighth day. So uh, that's one of the reasons. Uh, one of the reasons that one of the emphases here that I really want to keep in our minds is the Sabbath. A church that, that lives into the Sabbath rest of Christ, the Lord's Day, and all the other celebrations that come along with that. Okay. Uh, he, and he doubles down that this is a specifically Christian failure. It is because of us Christians that the world in which we live literally has no time. It is not true that the more life-saving devices we invent, the less time we have. When did he write this again? <laughs> 1963. Wow. Most of us wish we had a schedule that was a bit more 1963. <laughs> I, I remember when my, my dad moved us up here in the 80s, and I remember stuff in Charlestown, um, like winding down Saturday nights. And Sundays were slow until Walmart showed up. And that was in the, what, 97, I think. Things had already been changing, but when Walmart came in, they were 24-7. Everything in the area changed. And when I was working for United and I had to work Sundays, I can remember walking up, you know, across the, the ramp outside and all that by the airplanes, thinking, how did I get here? But a lot of that <laughs> stuff. Uh, but really, like, Lord, how do, you, how do you destroy mammon? Because that's why this is happening. This is why we don't honor the Lord's Day. It's because of mammon. How do you defeat mammon? And I'm telling you, like rose up on the inside, keep the Sabbath. Which it all means Jesus redeemed time. So, he says, uh, it is not true that the more... I just read that one. Okay. Uh, the joyless rush is interrupted by relaxation. Sit back and relax. But such is the horror of the strange vacuum covered by this truly demonic word, relaxation, that men must take pills to endure it and buy expensive books about how to kill this no man's land of modern living. There is no time because Christianity on the one hand made it impossible for man to live in the old natural world broke beyond repair the cycle of the eternal return what it, because the church changes it meaning like, in a, in, like you think historically Christ as the head of the church he changed time the eternal word became flesh and dwelt among us he changes everything by his incarnation and he redeems it so that when Jesus dies the whole law dies with him all of it it all dies with him when he rises he is the new creation which is why to be baptized is to have put on Christ 
and to be dead to the world and alive to God because you're part of Christ, part of that new world. So when the church then starts to live that out, move that forward a couple millennia, we end up into the modern era now where we're saying, well, that's all wrong, it all failed, we need to be more spiritual. You don't know what the word spiritual means if that's how you're looking at it because the net effect is what we're seeing today. So that I hear it all the time. Johnny shared this a couple weeks ago, but I heard somebody else yesterday telling me this. I hear it all the time. What is more pleasing to God? For a man to be in church thinking about fishing or motorcycling or whatever he plans on doing, to be in church thinking about something else, or to be out fishing and thinking about God as if that actually happens. Where did that dichotomy come from? It came from this. Well, you've got to get saved and have a spiritual life with God that's disconnected from the rest of the way that you live. That's where that came from. Yes, we need to be saved, but we don't think about that as a comprehensive, comprehensive event. We think about it as an internal, subjective, spiritual reality that makes me morally better and a better employee at my place of employment by showing up on time. If that's all Christianity is, God save us. Okay. He's continuing with the issue. Christianity has abandoned time, invited Christians simply to leave it and to think of eternity as an eternal rest, if not relax relaxation. We can still adorn ourselves with beautiful symbols and colorful rites that are ancient, but it's meaningless. It's all subjective. It's all what you want it to mean. It's all contextual, which is the way that's used today. So it's inspiring, it's uplifting, but it's not real. And I think about this. This is the, this is the, the whole debate for many of you, I know, because we've had these conversations, coming into a liturgical church. Because the idea is it's not real. It's just your style of worship, and styles can vary. On some things, they can. On some things, they really can, and they should. Because there's a difference in custom. But the whole notion that it's not real means that you have so spiritualized, and I don't mean like you, but it's been so spiritualized that it's not even Christianity anymore. This is uh, what he's just described here, which is, is, is where the whole uh, Philadelphia cream cheese commercials came from. <laughs> Remember the people sitting on clouds eating like, like cheese because it's light and fluffy? Like where does that idea come from that that's heaven? <laughs> but do you ever see Jesus or any of the apostles or anybody in Scripture talking about heaven like that? No. No, if anything, heaven is a place of dread majesty. Absolute stunning holiness. And every time heaven comes in contact with the earth, the people on the earth are either crying out, woe is me, have mercy, or they raise their fists in rebellion because they can't stand the fervency of God's love. This whole notion that God pours out judgment so people repent isn't true. They don't repent. The book of Revelation is filled with the inhabitants of the earth raising their fists and cursing God for his judgments because they won't let the, he won't let them go about the life they want the way they want. He won't do it. Okay. And so here's the question that he's going to end section 2 with. Did Christ, the Son of God, rise from the dead on the first day of the week? Did he send his spirit on the day of Pentecost? Did he enter time only so that we would symbolize it? Do you see what he's saying? Did the, did the word become flesh? Was the spirit poured out only so we could have symbols? Or was it because he's really transforming matter itself? He's doing something to the whole cosmic order, heaven and earth and all the material world, even the succession of moments like an everlasting telephone uh, uh, line. Did he really do that? Because if he did that, everything's going to change. We're going to stop escaping the world. We're going to stop praying to be taken out of the world. And we're going to start to really mean it when we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Jesus never taught us to pray to get out of here. He always taught us to pray for the kingdom to come. And when the kingdom comes, that's not primarily demonstrated through greater passion of the heart. That's part of it, but that's only a sliver. When the kingdom comes, society changes. Laws change. Mindsets change. Clothing changes. The way time is observed and days and weeks and months and years are kept change. Did God create the year of Jubilee in the law only because he wanted to give the people a spiritual symbol of what would happen when the gospel would be preached or because he was trying to indicate to all of humanity his expectation about the way that we deal with debt and human interaction with each other? And you can ask that question of essentially anything in the law of Moses. Again, it goes into something I, I, I had a conversation with some other guys earlier this week, too. The types and the shadows of the Old Testament. Types and the shadows of the Old Testament. What were they surrounded with? Gold, silver, brass. Um, I've only got this. Uh, like beautiful vestments. All of them. All of it. Even the way the, the pillars were decorated. The, everything. Those were the types and the shadows. Why do we think that the reality deserves less than the types and the shadows. The early church didn't. I posted it on Facebook uh, this week, and I got a mess, private message from somebody who's doing some evangelistic work on the other side of West Virginia, and his, his response was, this has to stop, dot, dot, dot. We're going to have some interesting conversations. Because I posted in, from a letter between the Roman government in 303 AD in North Africa. There's a list that the world made of when they raided the church. Remember I shared a couple years ago right. that the word uh, traitor, traditor, mm -hmm. traitor, the person who hands over scripture. Well, the, the, the church gets raided. And so Felix is the, the Roman official and there's a, a bishop named Paul. And with Paul are the priests, the presbyters, and the deacons and some others that are there, the sextons. Those are like the, the people working on property and stuff. They confiscate golden chalices, silver chalices, silver spoons, Baptism garments for men and women, shoes for men and women, uh, silver plates and dishes, um, candlesticks, brass candlesticks, all kinds of stuff are confiscated. Now, the early church fathers don't write about that. They write about the divinity of Jesus. They write about his humanity. They write about the, the gospel books. They're writing about that, they, and they write about how they celebrate, but they never really write about what they're using. We get that list from the Roman Empire before Christianity is legal. So while they're underground, they're using significant symbols. Because why would you ever honor the reality less than you would the type in the shadow? That's the whole thing in Hebrews. If, if they were killed by, by breaking the law of Moses... What do you think is going to happen when you trample underfoot the blood of Christ? And when he says the blood of Christ, you think he's talking in some abstract spiritual way. The blood of Christ. See, we've so spiritualized it, we've separated it from the physical world. And we can't do that because Jesus didn't do that. The sheer fact that we say Jesus means the word became flesh. And dwelt among us. Section 3, and uh, we're not going to get through it, so let me just say we'll pick up with Section 3 next week. But Section 3 is when he really starts doubling down um, on the Sabbath day itself. So hopefully next week we'll do 3, 4, and 5. I don't know that we'll do the whole chapter. Because what he does basically is in these first few sections explains the problem and then starts working it out through Sunday and then on out through other celebrations. So if you get the idea, then you can follow that pretty clearly as to how this impacts the whole of our um, our year, really. So, but I want to take the last couple minutes and see if there's any questions or comments. You may not have any questions. You're like, I already know this. I've done this for years. Yeah. Um, this is speaking of putting something on Facebook, I read this morning. Um, and, you know, these are strong believers. They put up a quote or a suggestion that said, hey, instead, talking about time and seasons, instead of jumping from Halloween to Christmas, 
why don't we take November and really live like we can, you know, focus on what Christmas is and what Christmas means and, you know, really come to Christmas with a, a sense of, you know, glory and, 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 and I read it and went, well, that's Advent. <laughs> it already exists. Yeah. But it's exactly what you said. People who have thrown that out and don't have it yeah. will try to recreate it because it needs to, it needs to be real. Yeah. You know? And I th so my take on that kind of stuff is that the spirit is in them yearning jealousy. Yes, yes. There's one church. There's one. We're all one in Christ by baptism. And our fractured, schism, schismed condition doesn't negate the one spirit. Yeah, absolutely. I was telling Johnny and, and Adam about uh, Advent. People are going to come in the first week of December ready for Christmas carols. No, no. That's John the Baptist. You brood of vipers. Who told you to repent? Yeah. Why are we skipping through Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving is a... It's a I mean, Thanksgiving is, is Christians being thankful for what they had. It is. It is, absolutely. And, but in, and, in this book... We're just going now from Halloween to Christmas? Well, no. In this book, he's a Russian Orthodox. So he wouldn't celebrate Thanksgiving in November because he's not American. Well, yeah. He, he yeah. never went through a great Thanksgiving every day. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. So it's yes. not, it's not yes. the same. Yes. But for our own, our own day... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Thanksgiving is something that we would observe... Mm -hmm. We would observe it for its American, our own cultural connection to it. But it's also a time to really emphasize that what is the great Thanksgiving? Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, absolutely. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Uh, so, like, one of the things we hit on was, like, the, the symbols within the liturgy that it's more than just symbolism. Right. How, what is the process, or what are the sources that we go about to figure out what is symbolism and what is style? What is symbolism and style, and what is like principle and actually has backing? Uh, yeah. So there, this is where I I really appreciate the Anglican patrimony, meaning like the history. When the Reformation was going on, the argument in England was keep everything you can unless Scripture forbids it, because there's a reason it developed. And they, their whole thing was, in the Law of Moses, don't move the, mo the boundary markers. Just because you don't know why they were there doesn't mean they don't serve a purpose. Leave them there. Right? So the way that we, we uh, you see this even reflected in the way that the Anglicans have classically counted the sacraments. There are two. Two gospel sacraments for every believer. But there are commonly called five more. Five more. So we get a total of, a total of seven. But that doesn't mean there aren't other things that aren't sacramental. So you go gospel sacraments, church sacraments, for ecclesiastical sacraments. Then you've got the sacramental worldview. So from the Anglican perspective, when it comes to um, uh, the liturgy, you've got the divine liturgy and those things that are commanded by Christ. So the, the, the verbs, the words of institution, the, the epic, there's things that are happening at the table that are specifically commanded by Jesus that have to be there. The way that this fabric is cut and made. That's custom. That's custom. What is this called again? Chalice Dale. Oh, sorry. That's no, okay. It's good. It's good. Um, how about this? Verse. Okay. What's a what's a Paul? What's that? That's the. Um, it's under the. You ever heard of a funeral Paul? Mm -hmm. Why do you think they call it a funeral Paul? Because this is the body of Christ. And it's veiled. We can't see it but by faith. Well, you don't see that in Scripture. Where it develops in history, I'm not exactly sure. But that would be more custom. It would be more of a, of, a, of a practice that is representing the teaching of Scripture through the, from the Gospels to Hebrews. We can't see this unless we have faith. Otherwise, you're just seeing a bare symbol that only has meaning if you have meaning for it. So, the Anglican approach is, is like this. Scripture is infallible. Tradition guides how we understand that scripture. And then we have reason, which helps us understand the things that neither one of those directly address. And so we would go with 
There is, there is symbol and reality bound together, which is the sacrament. When you are baptized, you are genuinely united to Jesus. Doesn't matter if you're sick or happy or depressed. Doesn't matter if you've got chemical imbalance in your brain. That does not determine how you're united to Jesus. You genuinely are in baptism. Are you saying that people aren't baptized aren't? Scripture doesn't talk about it. So we're not going to make an emphatic statement like that because then you end up with a whole other set of <coughs> theological issues. But Scripture says, do it. Okay. When you receive the consecrated bread and wine, you are feeding on Jesus spiritually. As sure as he is risen from the dead and enthroned in heaven, you are really, truly feeding on Jesus. Okay, That's when they're together. Then you can extrapolate down from that, from things that, are, that get, go from full things that are effectual in their observance and other things that are genuinely symbolic in the classic sense. A collar would be a clear example of something that's symbol. It's not a sacramental in that sense. This whole practice is one of the newer ones in church tradition. It didn't start until the 1800s. And it was by Presbyterians in England who got picked up by the Church of England, and they made it widespread, and then Rome picked it up. Hmm. Didn't come from the Roman Catholic Church. And why did they do it? Because of the rampant capitalism that suppressed the poor in England at the time. And so the capitalists who were suppressing the poor and like some pretty, pretty significant stuff. I mean, these, there's a lot, I don't have time. But what, what happened is they were wearing ties. And so the clergy said, we're not doing that. No ties, and they flipped the collars around as a matter of, of protest against that kind of abuse of people. Because what does, what does the scripture say about usury amongst the Jews? You cannot charge your brother interest. Our entire economy is built on usury. Yes. All of it. Yes. Even churches loan to other churches at usury. Like, have you not read the law of Moses? Well, that's the Old Testament. Have you not taken a class on how to interpret the Bible? <laughs> Christ didn't negate it. He fulfilled it. So if it's that way under the law, how much more under grace? Because grace doesn't say you give 10%. Grace says you empty your pocketbook. Oh, I better stop. Huh? Okay. Let's, uh, let's get ready for service. You know what I'm thinking about? You know how you were saying that? Advent, you know, the 25 days, you know, it'd be good if every family